Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome to episode 51 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And oh my God, for 51st episode, we have got an incredible guest today. We've got Rudy Reyes. I hope I said it right. Um, who's going to be answering you some got questions it, brother. today? Let's go. <laughs> right. So, Rudy, hey. please say hi, introduce yourself, and give us a quick sure. rundown of who you are and what you do. And I'm going to shoot some questions. Rockin'. Uh, Louis, uh, it's the 51st episode, and I just turned 51 years old. This was no meant way. to be in the stars, brother. <laughs> uh, my name's Rudy Reyes. Um, my full name's Rodolfo, Rodolfo Reyes. Uh, I'm of uh, Mexican descent um, from the border of Texas and Mexico. But Rodolfo, if you don't speak Spanish, is, is a long name. And so when I went to school, it just got tightened up, tightened up to Rudy. So mm. everybody knows me as Rudy Reyes, and it's kind of got a heck of a ring to it. Um, I used to not like my name, but now, I mean, I couldn't imagine being named any other thing, you know. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest and throughout Texas, um, had a, uh, pretty tough upbringing for an American. Um, I was, uh, I was in foster care and then the Omaha home for boys, a boys home. Uh, but as tough as it was, um, when, when I was taken by the state and put into the boys home, I was very sick. Um, I have two little brothers that I was taking care of and we all had lice uh, we had worms um we were living in a rough way but only in america can you come from nothing and uh and somehow survive long enough to 12 years old and then go into a boy's home where you get medicine uh i got uh the weight pile i was able to lift weights and eat food first time i'd been eating food in years really um besides scraps and uh and discipline and so i immer- uh, Im- immersed myself in in regimen i uh i became a wrestler I was a very successful wrestler in a very tough area of, of the country in nebraska renowned wrestling comes out of nebraska and iowa we worked the farm there in the boys home um and uh and i developed the ethics that would lead me really to the man that you're seeing now um hard work dedication and discipline uh after i uh at, Graduated from the boys' home and got old enough to get out of the boys' home. I took my little brothers with me, and uh, I signed us up at the YMCA, this little like Christian community center that has weights and a and and a fitness area. I was never into basketball or the ball sports, and I think possibly because when you're a boy and you don't have a father or any older brothers to teach you how to throw, catch, those are those are uh, very. Um, high-end mechanical skills, mm. I focused on wrestling and boxing. I focused on football. I focused on things that physically made me stronger and more aggressive so that I could protect myself. So at the YMCA, there was some martial arts going on, some Chinese Kung Fu. And it, immediately I started my Chinese Kung Fu journey. And, um, and then after a few years, I started training with China's national team and working with exemplary seafoods uh, from, from the Far East and around the world. I became an international freaking uh, champion, uh, fighting San Shao, which is full contact with throwing. Uh, later, it would be called Sanda. It was the pre- predecessor to MMA. Uh, it was judo and kickboxing put together and, um, and rose through the ranks and spent all my time eating, you know, vegetarian food to keep my weight down and drinking green tea. I mean, as crazy as my freaking Saturday night was, was that I do two sessions of training and then I would treat myself with like some uh, cherry pie with ice cream and green tea. That's as wild as Rudy Reyes got <laughs> in, in, throughout his twenties until about his mid twenties. And I joined the Marine Corps, the, uh, uh, on the USA today, back in the day when you read newspapers, the word on the street is that we are putting boots on the ground into Kosovo uh, to fight um, and to protect the people that were going through ethnic cleansing, the Serbs. And um, I thought it was my duty to fight for something bigger than myself. It's interesting. All, uh, all my time in martial art. Now, of course, I do MMA. I do all kinds of, I mean, everything is martial art. If, if, you're, a, if you're a man, you must discipline your body and, and your mind, and you must 
train in ways to fight, defend, and defend with your life if need be. I believe this is the truth, um, regardless of what uh, social experiments people are talking about a lot um, and, and what is now the, uh, the flavor of the month of what people think society should be. Mm. I've been to every continent uh, besides Antarctica, and I've fought in the worst and hardest places, and I've been at the most opulent and wealthy places too. Um, a man must discipline his mind and his body, and he must be prepared to fight and lay down his life to defend. And that's what drove me to the Marine Corps. I excelled in the Marine Corps, had the opportunity of a Marine Corps of 300,000 to try out for our commando unit, recon. The reconnaissance community is 300 men of 300,000 Marines. And you have to go through an arduous selection process, brother. And I was blessed to get, get the nod as an infantryman to try out. And I somehow made it through this freaking course because I'd never been in oceans before. I'm doing helicopter uh, insertions in the ocean and, and, and rope work and, and, and many things that I'd never comprehended ever doing. And, uh, and that led me into the reconnaissance community. I did not go to Kosovo because I was in training for four years. Combat died. Marine Corps scout, sniper, paratrooper, SEER school, demolitions, patrolling, um, helicopter insertion extraction, I mean, so much. And I happened to be on the ship as a force in readiness in 2001, September 11th. The towers were hit. My platoon of brothers and a platoon of SEALs and some bomb squad guys, EOD, we moved uh, into the Persian Gulf and then we went right into fighting Pakistan and Afghanistan. A year later, I come home, amazed I'm alive, running and gunning and fighting and you know, using our sniper assets and uh, close air support and such and mm. working for general Mattis directly. Um, and uh, shortly after that, I get the word on the street from our top secret clearance that we are preparing for the invasion of Iraq. If any of your audience watches HBO, they should check out generation kill. It's the true story of my platoon leading the first Marine division in the invasion of Iraq uh, in 2003. Uh, my team leader was hit right next to me. I had to take over the team like that. It was very tough conditions. It was one month straight of fighting. We did not sleep for at least two weeks straight, um, fighting in, in nuclear biological chemical suits, sometimes with gas masks as well, respirators, as you would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, chopped my way through there, made it back home, and then, um, and then prepared uh, to be an instructor, similar to what I do in SAS, DS, and Fallujah was exploding. So I had done two back-to-back -back wars, and now I was, uh, I was given the opportunity to take a fresh team, and we run five-man teams, to Fallujah, which would later be known as the worst insurgency in house-to-house -house fighting and urban combat since Way City. I chopped my way through there. Thank God I bring my whole team home alive. And we killed the enemy. And, um, and we did the best we could to help the Iraqis, but we were never really set up to stay long enough to do that. Uh, started to try to figure out what to do with my life back home, became a coach and a trainer in a boxing gym. And HBO called me to come work on the film. That's what set me into the entertainment business. I was still also doing counterterrorism and contracting uh, for triple letter agencies and state department um, in uh, both in the continental USA and then in Northeast Africa. So one foot, I was rock, uh, you know, still uh, a gunman and, and a, and a uh, operator. The other, I was a, uh, I was working as an actor or stunt coordinator or military advisor. Um, neither, none of it, None of my life was filling the hole that I had since leaving the Marine Corps. Mm. Um, my, my brain and my nervous system, my body, everything had shifted. And, um, and I developed a, a first, uh, I was drinking a lot, and then I developed a hardcore drug problem. Um, except when I was at work. When I was at work, I was completely engaged. But I, ne but I needed to have my life on the line to be... So, what work and, was that at um, the time then? Doing counterterrorism, right. um, okay. uh, fighting, fighting and hunting Al Shabaab, which is a derivative of the Al Qaeda, um, or leading um, 
uh, full mission profiles for bomb squads here in America in mm-hmm. top secret locations. Um, and then when I'd get a film or television show, I'd give it my all. But still, there was nothing inside. And uh, ultimately, I was in a men- mental institution for guys like me for a year. Uh, I lost my family, lost my self-respect and pride. I lost myself. I thought that that person is dead. And so really, I was a dead man walking in this life. After I came out of the mental institution, um, it didn't really help. Uh, we're looking for we're looking for answers for things that can only come from a higher purpose and a higher calling. There's no in my experience, this therapy can only do so much. Going to a rehab can only do so much. All these things are tools or bandages but until a a person builds a structure of one's life in a hierarchy of movement and thought process and be connected to their god um i i think it would be like missing one of your cylinders in the engine of your car it may still go but it's not going to be efficient and you will never reach the velocity it takes to really break through limits. Um, that being said, I was walking the streets in New York City. A filmmaker, that a brother of mine that I'd worked with, was creating. Was going on a dive trip. He said, "Rudy, you got to go." I had money, I had a job. He brought me to Cayman Islands. I saw the most beautiful underwater expanse, the most stunning life forms. I'm a combat diver and I do heavy duty stuff underwater, always with weapon, body armor, night vision, uh, Bergen, hardcore. Hit, hit, there's no, if there's no beach, it's a cliff and a climbing cliff. This is the first time I got to feel the healing nature of water holding me and looking at these gorgeous creatures and uh, this teeming hypertrophic cascade, this society that is living and dying and hunting and making babies, but honest and truthful and balanced and beautiful. When I found, uh, when Jim Ritteroff told me that these reefs uh, are going away, there's many different uh, causes. It's not just climate change. It's, pollu- it's pollutants. It's the uh, ocean liner industry building up harbor- harbors that wreck all this stuff. Uh, I said, we got to do something about it. So I created Force Blue. Um, a mission of redemption and, you know, to bring uh, buoyancy, uh, betterment and belonging to warriors like me, bring us back to life because we're killing ourselves um, in numbers and in percentages that we've never seen before, even commandos, even the best and the brightest. So now we re- uh, force blue commandos, um, Royal Marine commandos, recon Marines, pararescue men, uh, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, uh, we, I have a team where now we repurpose our freaking war skill and combat diving into rebuilding and protecting. Once Force Blue started, I started getting my myself together, um, started getting a little entertainment going too. Uh, and then I met Jay. When I met my woman, changed it all. Uh, immediately, I said, we're getting a place together. We're moving in together. We're in this thing together because now I have this hierarchy platform of what is important. After that, brother, the freaking phones start ringing. And I, I'd done so much work. I didn't realize that I was like a reluctant icon for the Marine Corps and recon and a humble example of warrior transition. And that and that's what happened. And I did this, I did this program called Once Upon a Time in Iraq. It was really big in the UK. I guess it won the bath does and all this. I was just doing the work because it was the right thing to do. I had no idea what an impact it would make. I guess it did so well. And so many people in the UK saw it. Minnow Films calls me. They, uh, I thought when they called me for SAS, I was going to be a uh, assistant DS, just a junior DS. Um, I had no idea about what was going on with Aunt Middleton at the time. I went on the recce with Billy and Foxy and uh, in Jordan. And again, I had no idea. And uh, after we did the recce and the vibe is so good, 
um, they say they would like me to be the chief instructor. And I said, whoa. That's crazy. But I called bro. Billy immediately. Yeah, I know. I called Billy immediately because he's the big brother I've never had. Uh, he's the big brother I have now. It was Billy Billy. And Foxy is my twin brother, he, except he's the big freak. He's the Hulk version, and I'm the Wolverine version, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I say, Billy, and he goes, mate, you got the energy, mate. Bruv, you know, I'm almost tired of this shit. Mate, you got the energy. Do it, mate. I said, okay. So that's how it all started with SAS, and now it's Special Forces on Fox, and, and sh I've shot four seasons of SAS you'll see the next two coming up uh, next year and going into my next couple seasons shot a series for uh, America doing some other stuff now too got my own production company um, it's just wonderful brother I had to first remember a purpose to fight for something bigger than myself and take action to do it and once Force Blue started then I attracted the woman to me once I had the partner and the love and 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 the woman, the eyes that I look at, into, that whenever I am not sure what I'm doing, I remember where we stand as a family and why I must champion forward. Mm. Then the, the the work started coming, and now the good work, and 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 now now hero living. My self help book that I wrote is being republished in the UK in May next year listen up my brothers and sisters out there in the uk i'm going to be on a book tour and you might just see billy and foxy too my homeboys um it's because first force blue and purpose um was created nothing about it was not surface it was purpose and that started putting things back together another thing out there anybody struggling with mental pain uh, depression mental health i know mental health is is really a tag phrase right now. Listen, everybody, it's just health. It is health, mind, body, spirit. Um, when we separate them, uh, that causes more dis-ease. So um, if you're feeling depressed and you're feeling anxious, the first thing you need to do is start working out. And you can work out in your, uh, you know, my, my gym is downstairs in the living room. A couple fire hoses filled with lead pair of 50 pound dumbbells, a mace, um, gymnastic bars, uh, and a pull-up bar and a rubber band. And I stay freaking strong because <laughs> it's the will to push myself. When you start working your body, your mind and your spirit come into alignment and then things will start subtly changing in your life. So that's my advice to anybody out there struggling. Damn, dude, that's a... That's that's a hell of a story you got there, man. And um, I, <laughs> I know. You know what? I, I have to say, actually, um, looking at you right now, I totally agree. You've got the Wolverine vibe going on with the with yeah, the hair. I know. Stuff. I told Marvel, I, brother I, Louis. I asked my agents. I said, "You better talk to Marvel, brother." You know what I'm <laughs> saying? And oh my gosh, I get this all the time. Hey, you look like Hugh Jackman. I said, "Yeah, he, you he's actually the do." Actor. And I said, and I'm the Wolverine, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. that. That's a good one, man. I, I like it, dude. And um, no, man, you, you've you done so much impressive stuff. And um, I mean, my, my first couple of questions were going to be about your backstory, but you kind of covered that already and stuff. But man, look, sure. so you've done so much stuff obviously with the military and you're doing all this, these things now and stuff. I just want to ask you just out of interest as well. So toughness and, and discipline is obviously a huge part of, your life as you said and I'm, i mean your top's not off right now but i mean dude you're you're jacked and, and that that's something that just shows Still freaking hard brother oh there Still he is hard. he couldn't resist 51. it <laughs> but yeah 50, that just 51 51 <laughs> bow, bow, bow. right absolutely you love Thank to you. see it, <laughs> thanks but... brother well you know what man this is the way we are designed. You know, there's a reason those... Have you ever been to Italy uh, and or Greece to look at the sculptures and statues? I have, yeah, yeah. I went to Milan actually just a couple of months ago. Amazing place. But yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean by That's, that, yeah. When you, uh, when you go to that... Uh, in Florence, that um, piazza, that big, big, big plaza, and, and they've got uh, Perseos up there, 
-hmm. and you're looking at these sculptures of freaking warriors. Remember, there was no protein powder back then. The mm -hmm. damn sure was no freaking steroids. There was no, like, uh, there was no air conditioned and uh, antiseptic area to train. Mm -hmm. These people, the very way of life made you strong. And on top of that, they practice martial art all the time, lifting stones, ran and swim all the time. And it made these premier physiques. I think we, you know, since we're little children, we, we read our comic books and, and we see our, our, our Sylvester Stallone, who's my, one of my dear heroes, who's now a friend of mine, uh, and the Van Dams and the Dolph Lundgrens and the Bruce Lees. Something about the modeling of strength and vitality, it inspires men and women alike and children especially. Mm. And there's something to that, brother. And I think that, you know, I used to say to myself, would anybody hire fat Rudy? <laughs> like, do I have to stay in condition for work? And the answer is no, I stay in condition for me. I stay in condition for me. And, um, and it's a beautiful uh, freedom created by daily self-discipline. Mm. I'll tell you what, man, that this this is actually a great question I wanted to ask you as well, man. Um, actually, one of the questions I have noted down here. Um, so, you know, definitely one of the things like like you just touched on now that's really helped you in film and life is this, you know, jack body that you've built, um, which to me just seems like the embodiment of discipline and, and determination. Um, so my question is, actually, what do you feel have been some of the most contributing factors in your lifestyle, routines, habits from the military or outside the military that you feel have helped you to get to where you are physically? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The humble, the humility mixed with ambition, the humble pursuit of ambition. You must have ambition. And I know in this kind of strange, sometimes, you know, they throw out terms like the patriarchy and, and, um, and um, this kinder, kinder, gentler uh, world in which aggression and violence is uh, evil. No, you must be ambitious and humbly pursue it because if you're ambitious, um, you're searching for something that's so far beyond that there's no way you can get there on your own. You, you learn from teachers, my sifus, my coaches, my Kung Fu teacher, Chun Man Sit, probably is the most influential um, instructor, coach, uh, author of my approach for training. He would always say to me, Ludi, do less, more time. So I would focus, if I was going to do um you know a reverse punch mm. instead of 500 times i would do it 5000 times instead of being overwhelmed thinking about the next cool crescent kick and remember i'm training with freaking china's national team and nobody has more beautiful kung fu and martial art than the chinese true he true. he yeah he he really focused to me that all of the form and technique I did spear, sword, all you know, southern form, freaking tiger, everything. These are just movements for the body to keep it supple. But if you want to be good, you pick uh, four punches, four kicks, two takedowns, an answer for any takedown to you. Mm. And number one technique, number one technique in all of fighting. No, get tired. All of a sudden, the mystery of martial arts thrown out the window. And, you know, Chinese are really into their flowery stuff. You know, this dude was so progressive. The name of his school was evidence-based Tai Chi. Powerful. He was not interested in anything but evidence-based. Will it work against a stronger, bigger guy or three guys? So what did we do? Condition, condition, condition. Free spar with tutelage on the outside um, and drilling, which is now all the all of the standard in 
MMA, drilling uh, handwork, drilling feet, uh, drilling takedowns and throws, uh, drilling defense, uh, uh, drilling groundwork, escapes, and of course, submissions. I do BJJ as well. Uh, drill, 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 and then uh, culminate them together and never overdo breaking down the hardware Instead, focus on expanding the software. And that means a lot now at 51. My training is different now. Uh, my warm-ups are much longer. I train much more intense, but with much lighter loads. So right. the joints are protected. I, When I look at my peers, brother, I don't know anybody 51 that's even close to me in health. And remember, I've been in combat and crushed myself carrying 250 pounds on my back, uh, you know, uh, saving Marines with freaking bullet holes, their freaking stomach. Uh, I, I have put myself through the ringer and I have arthritis. I had to have a knee surgery. My foot was smashed into three pieces on a bad parachute uh, landing operation. Um, uh, I've been uh, in the hospital with some hor horrible diseases from overseas brother mm. i just keep coming back and it's because of that tutelage from chun man sit he also said this when you when you are training your mind is shifting gears mm. your high end gear like the ferrari that you are is so fast he says i'm smaller and i'm older I may be just like a Ford Escort, but I can work the gas and clutch, speed through those gears. And you, Rudy, still have your parking brake on and you can only go to second gear. So we learn speed. How do we create a relaxed body to achieve speed? How do we have enough strength to do the 5,000 drills it takes to have speed? Because if you're not strong, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to start fatiguing or you're going to hurt soft tissue. This is really, really a quantum way to look at. It. So I put that mindset into everything I do. I do not have routines. I do. I have, um, I have uh, approaches. I do not have routines. I have um, skill oriented training, VO2 max work rate training. Then um, martial application slash field application training. So skills, drills, VO2 max, um, that is work rate. So it's a combination of speed and strength. You must have muscle, especially as you get older, brother. If you don't have the muscle, your bones start freaking, uh, um, they start deteriorating as well. Everything does, your mind does. And then the last is field application. Is my running good? Is my swimming good? Is my kickboxing good? Is my rock climbing good? Is my shooting good? Is my pistol just as good as my rifle? Is my knife fighting good? So I just ask myself daily, what needs work? And each one of those is extremely mentally, physically challenged. So I'm going to get some training. Now, if I'm going to do a photo shoot, only because I'm older now, my metabolism has finally slowed down. This is the heaviest I've ever been. I also have a great woman that loves to cook for me. Um, if, if I've got to do a photo shoot to show my best, I will clean up uh, my diet. Right now, I have no diet. I eat pasta, a lot of meat, vegetables, drink red wine. Uh, I don't eat um, uh, desserts, really. Mm. Um, and I snack. But when I'm, when I'm out on task, brother, I'm revving so high and I eat less throughout the day. If I've got to do a photo shoot, I just... Uh, go much more salad and meat, less carbohydrate, and take three days off of wine. So on the fifth day, I'm looking pretty good. But Sebastian Stallone said it best to me. Hey, Rudy, you don't get in shape. You stay in shape. I love that. That's really good. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing? And, I, and also another thing, if you're doing this, Louis, you should do it. I can see by your podcast. Stay in the realm of greatness. You need to have your knights of the round table. Even if you're the weakest, youngest knight that has the least amount of ability, you need to be putting yourself in those freaking uh, round circles of excellence and you will be learning. So I'm with my Sornex people. We call it the Bosco Brotherhood, the family of strength. We have strong roots. 
I've got Olympian throwers, Olympian swimmers, uh, MMA uh, champions, judo champions, um, uh, um, powerlifting champions. And we're all in our 40s and 50s now. And we continue to work and grow together. Um, stay in environments in which you are the dumbest in the room and you will continue to improve. And one day you're going to look around when you're my age, people are going to be coming to you. Um, it's so, so, so those are a few of my precepts that keep me going like I do. That's great advice, man. And, and yeah, like what, some of the things I've seen on, on social media and, and quotes and stuff, you know, it's hard to avoid them. Um, one, one of the really good ones I've always heard is that if you're, if you if you, if you if you have four friends, for example, who are all bums, you're going to be the fifth one, and it's the same for the opposite. If you're, awesome. yeah, if you have if you have five friends who are millionaires when when you're not or something, you'll be the next, and it's so true. I'm doing the podcast, talking to guys like you and stuff. It just puts you in the room of the right people, and it makes you want to level up and to be like the, these people. I love it. It's so good, and um, I think one one of the things that obviously you need to to do these kind of things is, is obviously you have to be tough and not everyone is born with it. You're, you're obviously a very tough guy, Marine renowned for it and stuff, but I'm just interested. <laughs> yeah. What do you, uh, what do you see as toughness and how can you get tougher for someone who thinks they're not? And where does it begin? And actually as well, good question um, with SAS, with some of the recruits and people you've seen on the show coming on and stuff, what's like an instant highlight of something that you've noticed that either indicates they're going to do well or they're going to crumble straight away? First of all, with SAS, specifically in Jordan and in Vietnam, the UK people have not lived in such extreme temperature. Mm. Extreme uh, heat and dryness or heat and humidity. You know, in Jordan, we were operating in temperatures that were 120 degrees. And that's just next door to Iraq where I was fighting. I've been conditioned to being in the desert for a long time. Mm. In Vietnam, 100 degrees and 100% humidity or massive flooding where recruits are not able to take off their boots and feet being destroyed. I think that leads me to the first kind of um, illumination. A, a simple way for anyone to get tougher is spend more time in the elements, in the, in the lakes, in your case up there, in the ocean, in the lakes, outside. Train outdoors when it's hot or cold. Um, it will, through homeostasis, toughen you up. Why? Because your nervous system does not go into high alert because it is becoming conditioned. Any of us, the first time we are impacted by fear, any human being, um, we wilt. Um, I was blessed. I just look at it as a blessing. I had a really hard childhood. So not having the food, not having electricity, being beaten up and neglected, um, it, it galvanized me into searching for justice and truth. It galvanized me um, in search, you know, even as a small mind, six, seven years old, you're saying, then what is the purpose of life if I am just being crushed and my little brothers are being crushed and, mm. and, we have no mother or father. And, and, um, and what is existence if this is, if this is it? And yet, we're observing a healthy family or some kids that have shoes on. Hi, honey. Um, and we're saying, why is, why is that not me? Okay, well, I love you too, baby. Well, if it's not me, then it's just not me right now. But I am going to fight for something and galvanize myself with the courage, really a, a throwback to, you know, chivalry. I, I will fight for the good. I will make myself stronger. I will first protect my brothers. It's interesting. I did not develop the initial toughness and courage for myself. What it was, my little brother and I were fighting with some neighborhood kids, some Irish kids. And... Um, 
uh, we, we lived in the worst house on the block, a rental house. My, my parents were rarely there. And, um, and we always had, you know, dingy clothes, no haircut. And we got in a scrap. I was six, Caesar was four. And the two brothers, um, I think they were the O'Leary's. They were talking mess. And then I had to blow up and fight. Well, it's because the older brother was picking on my little brother. And mm -hmm. I couldn't stand that because I know what it feels like to be powerless. I'm not going to let that happen to him. So I bow up. We start scrapping. I'm fighting the bigger brother. He's fighting the younger brother. Uh, and I've always had, I've always been an athlete. I mean, like all of us kids, ch children are natural athletes. I, I just stayed in it. Um, and, and he had glasses on. His name was Dennis, I think. And I had I, I had him on the ground and I punched him in the head and broke his glasses. And I started to cry. I started to cry. The cruelty of this world, the cruelty of myself having to do this. But I did not hesitate. And if that doesn't toughen you up, you start getting tough by actually leaving yourself available to real life. So true. I think that would be the first step. Hell yeah, man. That's such good advice. And I have to say, I mean, I've noticed it in the people of my generation and in social media and stuff. And even even some people I know, it's just like this generation, it's, it's just being so mollycoddled and there's so much time indoors, not in the sunlight, not in nature, not doing these things. And I totally agree. But it's, that's another thing. Mental health improves so much just from seeing a sunset or a sunrise and stuff. Immediately. Literally. immediately seeing the stars seeing the moon uh the sun um the grass we live in the country here in south carolina we walk our dog hank through the through the woods and it heals you we yeah. are meant to be this way it's interesting where our society i think uh, the european and americans what happened is we became victims of our own success we became so successful that we had so much free time that, uh, that, and some very smart people created entertainment as a product. And we have become obsessed with pleasure and entertainment as opposed to mm. having the, the inner uh, intelligence, the ancient intelligence that knows what makes us best as people is adversity. Uh, yeah. If I could find a way to inspire people to do this, even on a small scale in the beginning, I have to tell you, the recruits on SAS, I have so much love and respect for them. It is so hard for them. Remember, they're going into our world mm -hmm. and they have not been indoctrinated. I was indoctrinated through a boot camp. Um, we are uh, ostracized. There is no outside influence of any of any sort for three months. Um when uh, we are taught to respond as an affirmative, like yes, instead of saying yes, we say kill. Everything's killed. And so we had a bedrock of instant and willing obedience to orders that was then layered upon. Our civilians and celebrity recruits that come on SAS and special forces, they do not have that. And for them to experience true pain, heat, fatigue, cold, fear, and experience it as an adult, it puts a mirror in front of their face to recognize that they're not adults as they thought they were. Mm. They are at, are at best adolescents, regardless of their successes, especially the celebrities, regardless of their successes, they're adolescents or children because they have not, um, either through circumstance or through willingness put themselves through the fire because it must be done. In a sense, we give them this opportunity. It affects their lives. It affects uh, so many others that watch the show's life. It affects my life. It reminds me the beauty of bravery. And that's what these recruits do. Damn right. And yeah, it's so true. It's just, it's, it's got too easy. Everything's got too easy to get the dopamine hit and to have the, the instant gratification and stuff. And people by natural tendency do tend to go down the wrong route it's a shame and it's really bad for mental health but one of the things that you were saying as well which i really just thought of now as well um is people 
people don't fight anymore at all. People think it's okay to just stay in their room and everything. And one of the ways to actually, I think, probably get tougher as well is to put yourself in a situation where you can have a fight. And that would be martial arts and starting yes. a journey in martial arts. So uh, for my third question, man, I want to ask you. So let's say we've got a listener on right now, for example, who's not doing any martial arts. He's kind of he or she is just living a bit of a basic life and stuff. And they, they want to start martial arts and start something, but they just don't know where to start with it or what to do. What would be your kind of advice for starting? Where would you go with it? What, what would you recommend for like your first art and stuff? And um, and any any beginner tips, perhaps? Absolutely. All right. Well, the beauty about martial arts. So my Kung Fu teacher said this, Ludi, style no matter, because if it's bad style, but you work really hard, you make it good. Or you work really hard, you will look for other style. <laughs> so he never, he, my Kung Fu teacher also did karate. Uh, he did uh, Shorinji Ru. Um, he uh, connected me to a boxing coach as well. So I could really work my boxing uh, so I, the first step is, uh, young listeners or middle-aged listeners <clears throat> do not, uh, have paralysis through analysis. Don't search the internet and say, what is this best? Uh, what's most important is what is accessible to you now, it, depending on how much money you got or your environment. I would recommend, well, all of them are great. Of course, the BJJ is fantastic, mm. but you're going to have to have uh, you're going to have to buy a gi and you're going to have to sign a contract. OK, that's how it's going to go. I, I also recommend joining the military. You're going to learn to freaking fight in every way and to include knives, shovels, helmets and, of course, uh, firearms. Uh, that's a great way. You get paid to learn to fight. Um, I really like maybe just starting out at a boxing club to get your basic discipline and wind in athletics. Because if you're out of shape, boxing is simple enough, but um, intense enough to really start that journey. I love kickboxing, whether it's uh, AKA karate, um, uh, the Taekwondo. Taekwondo used to have a misnomer in MMA. What about Pettis? Pettis put it down <laughs> on a lot of people. Um, uh, again, um, Taekwondo and some of the Eastern martial arts and also uh, BJJ, you're going to have to sign a contract. But then again, you're signing a contract for yourself. I'm all for that. I'm just asking you where, where are you at financially? Uh, I love the Muay Thai and the Shaolin. Um, what I love about the kickboxing and, and, um, and Eastern martial arts is there's a bit more grace. Uh, poise is also important, which will start bleeding into other areas of your life. Um, Again, the most important martial art to start with is the one that is accessible to you, the Krav Maga. If you want to do self-defense, if you're a young woman or a small man and you're living in a rough area um, or you travel, I would recommend Krav Maga. Uh, Tony Blower does spear. If you ever yeah. get, get around Tony as well, the spear system. My Jade is now an instructor with spear and trains with spear too. Um Self-defense, Krav Maga, because it's no nonsense and it's fitness drills and exhaustion. Um, mar uh, martial art uh, for a long-term growth, start with boxing or Shaolin or Muay Thai or BJJ. BJJ mm -hmm. is wonderful because in real world fighting and scrapping, it always gets locked up in some way. Rarely uh, do you do, does a person have to um, it will engage with an enemy without some kind of gripping, grappling, or falling on the ground. Uh, this is real world. Um, uh, I started as a wrestler, and wrestling is so important because, first of all, I was just faster and stronger and more powerful than anybody. And you are taught to shoot, drop levels, and shoot. And um, if you take someone down with a double leg or single leg, uh, or uh, arm drag uh, to suplex on the head and then climb on top of them and just smash them to the head, even fight. Um, but uh, I, know, I, I know I spoke of all martial arts because, again, what is accessible to you and do not have paralysis by analysis, do it. The martial art that's best for you is do it. Damn ah. right. <laughs> that works for me, man. That's so true. And 
I think one one of one of the things that I've taken from this as well that I've recognised in martial arts as well is that all of them have applicable applicable things in them that can be applied to the other martial arts too like for example you said wrestling i'm sure i'm 100 percent sure that your experience in wrestling would have helped you in bjj i do bjj i, I know that wrestling experience helps judo very similar to it as well really helps and um actually absolutely yeah, yeah for for krav maga as well um i ha had a really good guest on he's, he's a master, master in krav maga um marcus Tugerson and and yeah, so guys, if you want to learn a bit more about Krav Maga as well, go and listen to that episode. It was really, really good. Um, I'll put a link in, in the description or something. But the other thing about martial arts too, um, from my experience with doing BJJ and stuff as well, is that it's so good for your mental health and it yes. helps so much. And man, I, I know that you, like you've said, you've touched on it already and stuff, but you've, you've had hard times and everything too. And um, actually this this leads well in, into, into my fourth question, man. Um. So obviously, you know, you've been through really hard times and it's easy to forget that when you see someone thriving today like you, especially on TV and stuff. Um, my last question is for someone who's listening, who's in a bad or a dark place, uh, they're not happy with their shape or their mental health is bad. They're, they're going through hard times or something similar. What would be your advice and what would you say to them to help them get back on their feet, change their lives and get onto a stronger and a better path? Maybe like you. All right. First thing. First thing you need to do is get outside and do as long as it takes 100 body weight squats, 100 mountain climbers, and 100 push ups, even if you have to do them from your knees. I guarantee if you got the balls and the guts to get outside, regardless of your shape, and if you're only doing sets of body weight squats and they're only and they're shallow. And you can only do five at a time. And when you get to 100, your mind's going to be expanding. When you get down in a mountain climber position, if you have to put your hands on a bench because you can't go down a full push-up, and you get your mountain climbers, and you get your chest working, your push-ups afterwards, you're going to show yourself you've taken positive control of your life. As you build some strength, and I guarantee you do that, for two weeks straight, your shape is going to be different. I don't care where you start. Your shape is going to be different. Then you will start having the confidence to get involved in a boxing club, a BJJ club. What I love about BJJ is this, the best part. When you fight and, and roll, you are, you are in combat. But it's safe enough to not be concussed. But it's combat nonetheless. Because when I get behind you with a choke or uh, or my triangle choke is a devastator and I'll throw it into armbar effortlessly. When I have a triangle on you from the top, you will know that my life could have ended. I'm going to push myself harder and get smarter. And our bones, muscles, and nervous system uh, through epigenetics, it starts turning on other uh, gene expressions. You will turn on positive gene expressions by getting outside and sweating and working your body. That will lead you to the confidence to do more martial arts. Uh, uh, one day, feel good about yourself. Get into uh, a gym or a CrossFit joint, throw around some iron. Start making you a priority. That's the way to do it. Great advice. I absolutely love that. I really hope that, that someone gets to hear this and it helps them out. And um, I know it's quite deep, man. It's really deep. Uh, I know that you mentioned a little bit about kind of addiction and stuff i'm just interested yes what was it that 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 got you out of there i mean uh, addiction is a hole it's a, it's a dark hole and and it's often hard to to climb out of that place and i'm just interested i mean you don't have to talk about it if, if you don't want to oh but yeah was there was there something that just clicked or what was it that kind of helped you get out of that situation well the first thing i will say from my own experience since I've been all around the world and, you know, I had freaking cocaine dealers in uh, Hong Kong, uh, you know, London, New York, L.A., anywhere and everywhere. I still go to those places. And, you know, there's this precept about stay away from places that you used to use that or whatever. I'll tell you what. I have no desire to hurt myself anymore. And. There is no compulsion because 
I have a higher purpose. And I realized, you know, I never even drank alcohol until I was 37 years old. I was filling a hole to numb an emptiness and a sadness I had inside. Um, I think, of course, getting clean, absolutely that has to happen. But shortly after that or during that, or maybe this goes first so you will get clean, you out there struggling with this need to really look into the light. And whether you need to pick up the Bible and talk to God or do Zen Buddhism meditation, or if you're Muslim, you need to get into your Quran and get deep with it. You need to remember that you were born and given the most miracle that could happen to anyone. You're born a human being. We listen to songs. We make art. We hug each other. If you were born, born an earthworm, you would not have this. You're born magical as a human being. Look at the light and recognize that you're part of that light too. Maybe when you start giving a, a shit about yourself, recognizing that you were put on this planet for a reason, and it's a miracle, and none of us know how we got here, and none of us asked for it. But it is, it is a miracle. You need to embrace that miracle and look to the light and then get serious about what hole you're trying to fill in with substances or gambling or sex or whatever. Um, that's my advice. That's brilliant, mate. I, I love it. So sound. And one of one of the bits of advice I've heard on the subject as well is that when you have an addiction and stuff, that's like you said, that's just filling a hole, isn't it? And it's very yep. difficult to just snap out of it. it. Doesn't really work like that. And some of the advice mm-hmm. I've heard before was that you have to replace it, and you have to you have to fill the hole with something else and martial arts is so good for that isn't it it's medicine martial arts is medicine it is medicine i've got a punch king bag getting delivered really soon a really high-end punch king for the uh, muay thai specialists out there you'll know punch king but they make this super stellar standalone bag so i can have it in the living room so jade and i can work on that thing there's it is medicine it is therapy and think about Think about the theater of war that we are expressing when we get into the dojo or the kung or the training hall or into our mind as we are, you know, whether we're practicing swordsmanship or firearm or or working in our kickboxing bag downstairs. You are putting on your psychological and spiritual armor of war of warriorness. When we become warriors spiritually and psychologically, we are planting a flag in the ground saying i am brave and i am taking charge against all comers and all the and most of our enemies are from within they're from within so when you start uh, when you approach martial art and you begin your martial art journey you are fighting the enemies within and you're taking charge with your spiritual and emotional armor your psychological armor and you're going to do battle that makes us better people i'm telling you it makes us better people so true so true and another thing as well about it is that it's not just the martial arts it's not just the fighting and stuff there's the brotherhood side of it too and i can guarantee oh the community oh so true honestly if you if you feel like you haven't got friends or people to listen to and stuff i can honestly say that the dojo is incredible because it's the one place i've genuinely been where i truly felt like race and gender and everything is just irrelevant there it's honestly you we've all got this one goal and that's to improve and everyone is helping each other to improve and honestly it's such a such a reason to 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 keep improving in other ways too and and you can really bounce off of that energy in these places can't you the universal warrior is waiting for each and every person out there regardless of your age regardless of your religion your sex your race the universal warrior is waiting for you and when you embrace that i'm telling you it uh it illuminates your life um it's uh it, to me it's the only way 
(laughs) (laughs) It's so true, man. Well, then, Rudy, this has been our four questions done for today, man. It's been a great one. And uh, before we wrap this up, it is time for what I love to call the shameless plug. So, Rudy, feel free to take a minute and promote anything that you want people to take a look at. Social media, website, anything. Send people to it. Gotcha. Send them out. (laughs) Okay. Well, first, Force Blue. Um, Our betterment, buoyancy, and belonging We rebuild coral reefs and do ocean conservation. We teach children ocean conservation, um, children of the fallen. Uh, It is, oh, talk about an emotional mission. Um, Get on the website, uh, forceblueteam.org. Find a way to get involved. Um, Definitely donate because it's nonprofit. Uh, And if you're a veteran in America, we, uh, any veteran from any time, can utilize the VA uh, vocational rehab budget to get their advanced diving. And after they're an advanced diver, they can come to us and be on the job training. So uh, we're healing oceans and we're healing ourselves. Mm. And I have, like I said, I have some commandos. I have an SBS commando as well, a legendary brother. I won't tell you his name, but his call sign is Ghost. And all you SBS brothers uh, out there that know who I'm talking about, the legend, Ghost. He's on my team, magnificent. I've got John Schlayer, Royal Marine Commando, on my team. Um, the next thing would be just keep following the show and supporting us. Um, you know, we have SAS Who Dares Wins on Fox. It's Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. You will see my new new show on History Channel in maybe four or five months. Um, I'm, I'm doing some clothing now with mm. 10,000. 10,000. These are the blacks that I wear on the program. They're my training clothes. Uh, I see myself in another year coming out with my own line. Uh, they're built for performance and the pure, raw, wild warrior in each and every one of you. Um, of course, I got a website, rudyreyes.com. You can see some of the work I've done. Um, really, you know what? This society and, and this uh, um, these friends, family, and fans have been so supportive of me. It's been wonderful. I want to say thank you for all that you've done for me and my family. And I know we're going to keep doing more and more together. That's brilliant, man. And this just sparked something in me, actually. You you mentioned about Ghost. And I've got to ask, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare oh, 2. Oh, that's right. How does, how does that feel to be in oh my a video game? <laughs> it is incredible, brother, because I had no idea it was so big. You know, um, yeah, uh, I'm um, I'm so possessed with with being in the world and pushing myself and and being with my family. Um, I didn't realize that the video game, specifically Call of Duty, I understand at any given second on any day of the year, any given second, there's four million people logged on playing. It's crazy. <laughs> Talk about a metric. Talk about a metric. And then they hire me to do my likenesses and photo shoots and create a character that then they rename my last name. Originally, (laughs) I was Sparks. Now they are. Now it's Reyes. And I didn't ask for that. And I I, they pay us well um, to do the work. And then I just, you know, it's just another job and put food on the table and moved on three years later. And I have young kids uh, stopping me in the airports. And, and, and kids taking pictures of me because I'm an operator, Reyes, on uh, on Call of Duty. And on Instagram, my Instagram is real Rudy Reyes. I got a message from someone. How does it feel to be an operator on Call of Duty? <laughs> I said, well, I'm just myself. And and the lady is like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's based on me. And this, this was my life before. She's like, oh, my God, I had no idea. Uh, you know, I thought you were just a model or a, fit, or a fitness guy. I'm like, no, it's it's art imitating life and it's spiraling up and out around the world. It's incredible. That's just jokes, man. And I'm getting that game for Christmas. Um, I don't suppose awesome. you can take a guess of which character I might be playing as. <laughs> oh, I hope you're playing me, brother. I've got the raddest freaking uh, kit and equipment. <laughs> <laughs> my my uniform was hand designed in real life. You know, I showed up to the photo shoot with my own stuff. Thanks, brother. It's a great homage, man. A really incredible homage. Hell yeah, man. And very, very last thing I want to ask as well. Um, 
for for the fanboy in me, is there a little marine slang or SAS slang or something or a little term or expression I can rip off of you and start using? <laughs> yeah, brother, we say we say Fido. 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 Oh, there it is. Fuck it. Fuck it. Drive on. So put the pain out your mind. Fuck it. Drive on. Fido. Love it, man. Dude, thank you so much for joining me today for the Talk For podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, man. Awesome, Louie. I'm sure we'll be linking up sometime, brother, out there. I'll be in the UK, you know, in a couple months. So we'll make it happen. Hell yeah, let's do it. Um, Yeah, we'll discuss that after this. But hey, guys, thank you okay. so much for listening. This has been episode 51 let's go and if you'd like to listen to our past episodes make sure to hit that subscribe button have a look at the past videos and stuff got loads of good people coming on soon as well so it's all it's all kicking off and uh yeah guys like i said spread some love leave a comment leave a like and check out really stuff in the description see you guys later peace out